Well, we have questions, but also one of the things that's time sensitive, I guess we could say. Last night, as we are recording on A and E, another in the series of WWE biography episodes. This being the biography of the Ultimate Warrior. Oh, well, I see why that A&E made the move to jump in front of the dark side of the ring and, and, and change the, the A&E changed their original schedule so that when they heard what dark sides was, so they could get their warrior show out first. And I see why they're wanting to try to whitewash a little history here with Mr. Warrior with portraying him in, in a positive motivational light. Uh, the week before Dark Side of the Ring tells everybody what they already know about what he was. Uh, I would assume, because they're going to tell the truth. I'll be on that one, by the way. Um, But let's talk about the biography version. <sighs> you know, and maybe I'm, I'm by, you came along a generation later. So maybe I'm more biased. But I lived the 80s as both a dedicated, diehard wrestling fan, which is how I started out the 80s. And still after I got into business, I was still a, the biggest fan of wrestling in the world. So I started as a fan and then became a professional. And the Ultimate Warrior offended me on both counts. Um as a fan you remember or if you don't remember you remember reading the stuff that was written a few years beforehand in the at the time where warrior was first getting the push he was the the anathema the the poison pill to every smart fan in wrestling the small number there were at the time because everything he did related to the wrestling business was the shits except for sell tickets. And it was infuriating to the, the, the smart fans, the few sheets that existed, the observer readers basically, or any, because it's just you. I mean, you saw the clips on this show to remind you the work looked like shit. What there was of it. He couldn't go 10 minutes or the fucking people would start throwing shit. He had to get in and get out. And what he did looked horrible. The promos were incomprehensible. The whole gimmick was, as the show also illustrated, aimed at kids. Because all of the talking heads, almost none of them actually knew him, worked with him, or were even adults when he was... On top, they were all said, yeah, when I was nine years old, the Ultimate Warrior was the greatest. So the, the, the fans, and I won't even say all smart fans, people also forget that at that point in time specifically, the WWF and WCW had two different fan bases. Of course, there were always crossovers with some people just watched anything with ropes and turnbuckles. But there were very distinct fan bases that came from WCW being a more Southern product and the WWF coming from the Northeast. So at one time, they had completely distinct fan bases. And then Cable changed that somewhat. But for all the reasons that we've mentioned, that Vince McMahon, the WWF, the national expansion, they didn't draw in certain parts of the country, like the Carolinas, Tennessee, Texas places with really strong local promotions, not just because the local promotion was so strong, but because a lot of those people, and I would hear from them when I was walking into the building unsolicited, <laughs> I would hear from a lot of these fans. They thought the NWA was the adult product, was more serious, was real. However, they phrased it. The WWF was cartoon, it was phony. It was too show busy, however they phrased it. So those fans that Hogan worked because Hogan could also work and Hogan could talk and connect with people. The other bodybuilders in wrestling, and we can talk about them here in this discussion here in a few minutes, had had varying degrees of success depending on 
whether they ever tried to and and accomplished learning to work or not. Uh, but Warrior, would you say Brian was really the first total Vince McMahon creation out of whole cloth? This guy looks great and is in no other way suited to be in this business, but we're going to push him and we're going to smash him over. And because of the look and the style that I am creating, it's going to work. He was the first all, you know, everybody else had come from a territory where they'd spent some time. They had some experience. This guy, he just, you know, he, I, I know warrior had worked six weeks in Memphis and been in Dallas for four months or whatever the fuck, but, he pretty much just smashed this guy over with no help from the guy because the guy didn't know what he was doing. Would this would that be the first notable case of, of Vince doing that? I don't know. And I think that's a little harsh towards what the Ultimate Warrior, Jim Helwig, did bring to the table. What but, did he bring to the table? I mean, no one, to play that role and for it to work in that role, and like you said, you and I have different perspectives on this based on our age and when we started watching wrestling. You may not realize, but I don't know how many people could have pulled that off and done what he did in his bizarre way. Well, no, I'm not saying that somebody else could have done it, but the look, nobody else looked like that, especially I in, mean, Vince in the tried early it with, days. Vince wanted Tom McGee to be that guy. And it's interesting to think about the fact that he went with Warrior. But what? But we'll go back and look at the tapes, though. The one thing that Warrior had that McGee didn't have was Warrior looked like he was going to have a stroke every time you saw him. He ran to the ring, he shook the ropes, he did all his shit, he ran in place. That's why he was always blown up. He had no cardio anyway, but he couldn't go fucking eight minutes because he's having a goddamn aneurysm the whole time. McGee was almost fucking, you know, laid back. So I'm saying... Warrior's body look and intensity, the way he delivered the promos, even if they were complete nonsense, you couldn't understand it. It just the it was the over the top cartoon eighties era of the WWF. He looked like a superhero. He acted that way that not even no grown man ever acted like, but also no fucking crazy wrestler had ever acted like. Because only in his mind did any of that shit make sense. And I've said it before, it's like, when Jimmy Valiant was handsome, Jimmy Valiant is a baby face. His fucking promos, if you wrote them down and read them back, didn't make a lick of sense. But because he said them that way, they got over because it sounded like him, something he would say. I'm just saying the whole thing with Warrior was the look, the body, the physique, and him looking like he's going to have a stroke all the time. And Vince smashed it over, had every top guy in the company, not only put him over, but put him over quicker than they'd put over anybody else, including and up to Andre. And, and it didn't last long because it wore thin because like go back and look at the history of bodybuilders in wrestling. They've been around since the days of the bodybuilders, but the ones that learned to work, and I mean, Don Fargo was competition bodybuilder in his before he got into wrestling. And at various points in time in his life, you could see it because he'd train down and do whatever. But then other times he looked like shit, but he learned to work. Then you got guys like Magnificent Zulu that we talked about had to go from place to place because he looked like a million dollars, but he was a shit. So once you saw him three times, like, fuck. Um, but, but, the, but they gave the Ultimate people, Warrior nothing. But that's the other thing. It's it's. It's not like they gave him the title. And again, again, different perspective. I was 10 when he got the title. They gave him the title, and then whatever excitement an Ultimate Warrior fan had over that title win was gone pretty quickly because he had no heels. He had no one to work with. They brought back Rick Rude. He had just beaten Rick Rude the year before. Uh, even though he had a haircut, it was still Rick Rude. There was no one for the Ultimate Warrior to wrestle. The WWF at the time, just like they did with Diesel and other people, as soon as he got the title, all of a sudden, it's a different Ultimate Warrior than the one that won over the fans. But he had no one. They, they look at 1990 WWF is a rough year. There isn't a lot in terms of singles heels. There's Earthquake, who's working with Hogan most of the year. There's not a lot there for Warrior. He doesn't get a lot until 91 when The Undertaker shows up. Hey, on the on uh, the flip side of that, would you want to work <laughs> with the Ultimate Warrior? Hey, no, boy, I'd love no. to. 
No, I wouldn't. Uh, but and anyway, that's what I was going to say is the, the, the fan, the dedicated fans, the fan, traditional wrestling fans, they were like, what the fuck? And guys in the business, that's where really the the concept of who Vince, what what look you had to have for Vince McMahon to hire you and push you in the WWF was cemented. And a lot of guys who were never going to look like that, but were fucking talented, resented that, obviously. Um, but also, that's when everybody either tried to start started trying to look like that or guys got into business basically because they already looked like that and that's where we had to go through that several years of just insanity with everybody that had ever lifted a weight but you know but that's the thing it's it's it, i i guess i liken it to in the music business you know when they pushed Millie Vanilli and there's all these bands going what the fuck or you know, just because some schmo is is a big name actor, they get a plum part that a real artist could sink their teeth into or whatever. But it, it's just from the start of I'll just say from the start of him being in the business, nobody ever said he wanted to get any better. He wanted to learn. He wanted to understand the way that you the psychology of wrestling or the way you thought about it. Everybody talks about how he wanted to get himself over and create whatever the fuck it was he was creating, but nobody ever says he knew he was the shits. They say the opposite. He thought he knew everything. Even on this show, I think it was Lawler that said it. The matches were the shits, but you couldn't tell them. And I, rem I remember... And that was 1986. Yeah. Early on, yeah. Yes. And it, well, no, as a matter of fact, even late 85. 85. That's right, yeah. 85. The and I've heard that in several places. He didn't want to put when they first got to Memphis and they did the thing with Phil Higgerson, who was a babyface, Warrior Hellwig. Actually, said, "Well, well, what, why should he beat me? Well, that's ridiculous. Who's going to believe that?" And they had to tell him because number one, it's the business, and number two, that fat fuck, if he wanted to, could really beat the fuck out of you easily, and he didn't like hearing that. And it, it, the same thing they alluded to in this show when they went to Mid-South, and Sting kind of said it nicely. He already thought that he should be paying, getting paid top dollar, didn't like the fucking wrestling lifestyle. I'm sure the road trips in Louisiana, after he'd been this, you know, fucking bodybuilding fanatic in Atlanta, and all of a sudden he's wrestling in Louisiana, that fucking was probably stressful also. But instead of doing what everybody else did and sucking it up because you're the shits and you just started and you need to learn. He tried to hold Watts up for more money and, and wasn't going to fucking go to the shows and blah, blah, blah. And that's when Watts told him, you know what? You need to find another line of work and kept Sting and Sting did it the right way. And, and then the, this fucking guy gets pushed by, a, a, the, let's face it, the world's biggest wrestling promoter who's had a lifelong bodybuilding fetish. And they both end up Sting and Warrior on top of the two big companies, but Sting actually learned and paid attention and tried and ad admitted he didn't know what the fuck he was doing, and the other guy just had somebody hand it to him. So there was a lot of heat from the fans and from the wrestlers on this guy. And I've told you what Bobby Heenan thought of him, and et cetera, et cetera. So... I as the first time I saw this on television, I was already in the business, but I said, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. It's the ultimate difference, uh, no pun intended, between the traditional NWA style of pro wrestling and this WWF ice cream bar cartoon bullshit. And that's why I've, I've always, and I've, Sable is the female ultimate warrior to me. They have had a track record of being able to take people with absolutely no discernible talent whatsoever for the job at hand, except they look great standing there and Vince can work that mass hypnosis and get these schlubs over. And it just always used to drive me out of my mind. But anyway, um, they went to great lengths to babyface him from the start on this. They had his mother, his football coach, his daughters. I didn't know he was from Crawfordsville, Indiana. 
That was surprising later on in the episode where he talked about Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher. The idea of him watching them when he was a kid. Well, and see, that's the thing. You didn't actually have to watch Bruiser and Crusher when if, if he was born in what, nineteen uh, sixty ish. So if you were a 10, 12 year old kid in Indiana, you didn't have to ever see a wrestling program on TV ever to know and hear Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher. I refuse to believe he ever watched him on fucking television. I refuse to believe he'd ever seen a wrestling match before fucking Bassman got a hold of him. He didn't get mentioned either, did he? <laughs> the, the guy that was running the gym instead of Bassman. I wonder where that fucking slime ball ended up. Um... But anyway, here that they baby faced him, his daughters, his mother, his football coach, his small town beginnings. Um, he looked normal in high school. He was what 150 pounds lighter than he was three or four years later. There's a red flag. Who is author David Shoemaker? That's the fucking guy from the Andre the Giant documentary that was just making stuff up, but saying it like he was an authority, like he did here. And he knows what he's talking about. He was the guy who said Andre toured the territories as a heel attraction for the baby faces to beat. Don't we know every person of any note that has written any type of book about wrestling? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so if this guy haven't written a book about wrestling, then what does it make a difference if he's an author of fucking classical Middle English poetry? Why is he on a goddamn biography of the Ultimate Warrior? Well, apparently he did write a book. Years ago about wrestling. What? I don't know. He had some kind of character. I think he's like the masked man. Oh, and he was God. on like a podcast on, I think it was Bill Simmons, because Bill Simmons uses this goof in his various things. Like he has credibility. But he's like one of these guys that liked wrestling enough to want to talk about it and do a podcast, but didn't like it enough to learn anything about it. What a goof. Uh, well, that's and that's the thing. I'll jump ahead. I made this note later, but the talking heads are all podcasters, and this is their descriptions: podcasters, authors, comedian, a comedian, and they're all fucking forty years old. And every single one of them was a kid when the Ultimate Warrior, and then and shit stain somehow ended up on this. You realize that not only was he not in the office, he wasn't even working for the company. Until the Ultimate Warrior came back in fucking 1996. And he's talking about his 80s run. I was actually sitting there and thinking about the timeline and trying to think if he would ever have been around the Warrior other than 96. And he wasn't no. even on the writing team yet in 96, was he? No. Well, it, it, no, he was writing the magazine. Right. So he was there and he could, he would have had interaction, but not until 1996. No. But he probably did comments from something else, and they just, because did you notice nobody that actually worked with this fucking guy on a regular basis in the ring was even quoted? So Vince said some things. Was was Bruce even in here? I'm not sure. Once, I don't know. He, once, once about the '92 drug test failure. Okay, all it was people who were fans of his as a wrestler, and nobody who actually had to suffer his presence as a human being hey i'll tell you what i'll give you a great example and i love him in this and he's much like you guys during your active careers he's kind of becoming the northern version of you in these documentaries Heyman, paul <laughs> Heyman was great here i can't think of when paul Heyman would have ever have had any interaction with the ultimate warrior no, but that's the thing is Paul is so brilliant and he's and he's got such a vocabulary and he knows the ways to word things where he didn't bury himself. But he didn't actually say a ton of glowing things about the guy, but he worded things in such a way that it, it moved the story along without really being committal in a large part. And he could focus on whatever was good and, and magnify that rather than. Uh, you know, go through it. But yes, but Paul is doing a, a good job because he I, I've, obviously he'll sit down and prepare some things to say about whoever the fucking person is that they're addressing. Um, But no, I don't I I can't imagine he would have had any interaction with Warrior except. Did I don't know, did Warrior ever go to Studio 54 when Paulie had any of those press parties or. No, well, there you go. <laughs> Um, so Warrior gets a bodybuilding fetish in high school. 
And am I the only one that when they started showing all the covers of muscular development magazine in the seventies and all those bodybuilders and seeing what he went from to what he wanted to look like, because as not only when you put on a hundred pounds or more, not only is it an obsession and, and there's means in which to do it that aren't healthy, but it just come on. When you go that far, there's something wrong with your adjustment of who you think you are. And I'm wondering, since he turned out to be so anti-gay later on, am I the only amateur psychologist, psychiatrist that have connected this bodybuilding fetish and uh, with his fear, not fear of, he said, I'm not fr afraid of the Q words. But his obvious phobia toward him having to prove how distasteful that is to him, methinks he doth protest too much. Is there some fucking Freudian thing going on there? What do you think? I'm not going to play Sigmund Freud here and try to guess. I will say he was certainly very into his own unique style of masculinity. I get like kind of I once read something somewhere where they said Tom Cruise walks into a room and he finds the guy who's like the most charismatic and he just starts behaving like him because he wants that reaction and with the warrior I think he just kind of had in his head cuz he didn't have that male figure based on what you're hearing in his biography like he kind of in his head had a certain way he thought men behave masculine ways and that became part of his thing. I, I don't know. I'm not going to accuse. I think he. I mean, he, Harry Harry White was in the bodybuilding. I can't. He really, well, I'm not saying no. Now, see, now you're you're conflating things. Harry, you can be into something without being fixated on it and fucking changing your whole life around uh, about it, even if it's an un unhealthy exercise know. enterprise. How he he moved to California to be a bodybuilder. A professional bodybuilder? Hey, let me let me put it to you this way, because here's the way I could relate to it. If someone who thought very little of professional wrestling saw your magazine collection when you were 17 years old, 18 years old, any of our collections, they'd be saying the same thing. My father walked into the room once when I was dubbing a Memphis video in the middle of the fabulous ones in a barn chewing on hay <laughs> to the Gap Man. My dad thought I was gay for years because of that. Because you can't explain it. Uh, uh, I'm making a copy. Let me, let me just tell you one thing. Those pictures sold to a predominantly female audience like pussy on a troop train. We couldn't keep those things on the fucking tables of them in the hot tubs and the barn and the fucking straw in their mouth with their blue jeans opened up and everything. Well, anyway. My point, though, was a lot of people would probably look at people like us professional wrestling fans and see some of these magazine covers of wrestling magazines and think the same thing. So I don't think it's fair. All right. But he's definitely on steroids by 18 minutes into this thing. And he's gained 150 pounds. And then they show the Memphis debut with Lance. And I, I, I love seeing this kind of stuff and Lance Russell <laughs> on television now in this day and age. Hey, forget that. Did you think you'd see Buddy Wayne on national well, TV? Well, that's what I was amazing. <laughs> And Buddy Wayne, his work looked better than Warriors and Stings. Every that's they showed enough of that footage to show as baby faces they sucked, so they switched heel, and then they as heels they sucked. And I've told that story before when I came home Christmas of '85 and watched them go 30 minutes with Lawler and Dundee in Louisville, and it was fucking brutal. And every one of the boys is watching, laughing. They weren't laughing two years later when those two schlubs are making a million dollars a year. But anyway, um, they did intersperse some of the Memphis and Mid-South footage here, but it's, you know, it is what it is on these shows. Um, I, I had never heard a story, much less the story, so I don't know if this was correct. On Did they, did they name him Dingo Warrior because of one of the boys' dogs? I had never heard that version of it before. I'd, I, but where did the Dingo Warrior gimmick come from? I thought it had come from Gary Hart. But Gary Hart, Gary Hart had, reads had, lots had, of magazines, and he said the Dingo was a dog. You, you know, like, no, I could but, just see him thinking of it. 
but Gary hadn't been doing that much LSD since he left Australia. <laughs> so why would they announce the Dingo Warrior from Queens, New York? All of this was true. From Queens, New York. That's the funniest part of the whole Yeah, thing. I mean, or were they just, were they ribbon Hellwig? But why would Gary Hart be, you know, involved in the, because he was his manager, because they thought he, and that's the thing, he was, he was a heel, but the people started cheering him just because he didn't know how to work and he did impressive shit. And he's even got Gary Hart as his manager and the people are still going, dingo, dingo. I like, well, first of all, they intersperse the clips of him as a heel and him as a baby face. They really didn't do any justice in terms of a chronological history of the warrior, right? The clips were jumping back and forth all throughout yeah. the documentary, but especially in Dallas. Mustache, no mustache, heel, baby face. You could certainly see Gary Hart's eyes. This guy shows up. He's just thinking, oh, if I could just latch on to this guy, you know, where can we go? But uh, that didn't work was out. That, was that one of the times? Why did they get him? Was that like the Billy Jack thing a couple years beforehand? One of the boys was either hurt. Was that after Carrie's wreck? It was after Carrie's wreck, cause, uh, or at least right around the same time, because it would have been the summer of 86 that he got there. Yeah. See, yeah, that's uh, generally they would try. Remember, that's how Billy Jack came in in 84 because Carrie was uh, up for and almost got uh, a part in a movie, but then he didn't get it. Rocky so he, four. Came, he kept Rocky Four. So he came back <clears throat> and then they, you know, Billy Jack left. And then every time that one of the boys would go down, they'd try to find some impressive baby face physical specimen that they could do something with. I don't fucking know. But anyway, he, he, he Watts was was telling <laughs> Fritz, I'm sure, hey, if you if you want him, you can have him. But here's the problem I've had with him. Um, but anyway, I, I've I like the note that he went to his ten year high school reunion to show off and fuck with people that he didn't like. Um, that was pretty great. I have to say that was pretty great. And then we got to the WWF stint and his introduction and the highlights and that's where i really because i did not watch the tv at that point right or it really we've mentioned it at any point um on some of the pay-per-views that watched the big matches if they i thought they were going to be any good but the wwf tv is really the only tv that i wasn't seeing late 80s because i got the tapes from everywhere else um uh, but going back and looking every clip that they used is is pretty much the impression that i had of every match i ever saw of warriors the shit looked like shit and it was just it's spastic and the goofy facials the huffing and puffing the gesticulating and finger pointing the stagey overacting can you see who the, the, the warrior was patient zero, but can you see why I, the first time I saw young twinkle toes in ring of honor back in like 2006, when they said, Oh, look at this guy from Canada. I said, he reminds me of the ultimate warrior, but maybe this one will learn. Anyway, um, he did the worst body slam on Andre ever. Of course, to be fair, that was later in Andre's career, but Andre was trying to post up for him and he didn't fucking get under him at all. Um, his wife calls him warrior. I know he changed his fucking name legally so that he could trademark his own shit that never went anywhere because he was never anybody after the wrestling business, but his wife now that he's dead and she's doing a documentary on TV, couldn't call him Jim. Does that just not sound so fucking goofy? How do you feel as a Jim? Does it bother you that he ran from the name? <laughs> no, actually, I don't want to share my name with him. However, uh, that ju it just sounded goofy. My husband, Warrior. I would expect that they would anyway do you call him war for short war breakfast yeah i was like you know her real name was virginia they used to call her virgin for short but not for long <laughs> um i am pretty sure that this is the first time that i ever saw any clip highlight or part of the match of hogan versus warrior what they showed on this from program. 1990 really yes I don't ever remember. I wouldn't have gone out of my way to say, oh, I've got to see that. 
I was on the road at the time. I was getting tapes from everywhere. The, the TV shows that still existed, the territories that still existed. Uh, but I wouldn't have watched that on purpose. And I don't know that I ever went back and had any cause to after that. So I'm pretty sure I never saw it. It lived up to all my expectations of what it would have been. Um, and then Shane McMahon puts over how hard Warrior worked to get to the top. Jesus Christ. It, I don't know that he was ever in a car with any veteran and asked one story. <laughs> asked for one fucking story. I don't know if he was ever in a car with a veteran. I've heard he got his own locker room, and, they, and he had a driver, and he didn't dress with most of the boys, if any of them. Why Why does Shitstain talk in that annoying cadence where he puts periods in the middle of sentences and no <laughs> punctuation after the end of them? Question mark. Um, did you love the video of Warrior giving the apology to the... I can't remember if I even knew the guy's name or his connection, but this kid that Warrior... Blew off was rude to in an airport, really hopped on, was I at one point I I knew what kind of connection he had, but it was somebody important to the business at that point. Um and you know he's he was basically fucking Vince was telling him what to fucking do, but he was he was gonna argue about it regardless, right? How'd you like Vince saying it's a work? It's a work. It's a work. It was so that was the first time that I've seen footage of Vince producing somebody on TV. Has there been more I've missed? It gave you an insight into how Vince kind of cajoles things out of you. Not just that one, but all throughout this, I was maybe most intrigued by the outtake footage of the promos. I'd like to see what else they have. They probably had a lot of outtakes, busted takes at least. Uh, if, if that fucking one or two that they showed was any indication. Um, so anyway, at that point they start telling a story Well, he was flipping out and a lot of the talking heads were trying to present it from his side. Like any of his behavior was justified at all ever. Um, re-injuring Bobby Heenan's bad neck and, and not apologizing and just going, Oh, well, eh. Anyway, um, I can't wait. Did I mention for Thursday night for Dark Side of the Ring? Uh, I like the line Vince. We said, I couldn't wait to fire him. And that letter, I have a copy of that letter around here somewhere where he called him a legend in his own mind. You, uh, the, They could have read more of Warrior's letters to Vince and it would have sh illustrated more to the normal public how fucking fixated this guy was on that he thought that he should be the biggest deal in wrestling and should be treated a certain way and this and that and the other thing and all the sacrifices that he'd made for Vince McMahon and the WWF. When I remind everybody that this was a guy that had been kicked out of two different territories and the only person that wanted to give him a spot at all was the guy that had a fetish for pushing bodybuilders. And if it hadn't been for Vince McMahon, then what was Helwig's backup plan to say he was going to be a chiropractor at one point? He would have been the most muscular chiropractor in Atlanta if it hadn't been for Vince McMahon. But he thought Vince was a father figure. That was one of the funniest things. They had all these people throughout the whole thing saying that because his own father left him at 10, he saw Vince as a father figure. And then they even had his own mother say that she thought the Warriors saw Vince as both a mother figure and a father figure. And then they go to Vince and they say, did you see him as a son? And Vince says, no, I have a son. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? And then when when he they started doing the drug tests on him when he when he came back for the last run in ninety two there they showed that he was first he was taking Motrin and then he was about six months later whatever he's taking all these antidepressant anti this anti that here's the thing a lot of people mentally can't handle the pressure of being a big star 
That means that if, they, if they're not equipped for that line of work, maybe they shouldn't ought to get in it. But to act like, I mean, I've known guys that had real pressure in the business and real pressure whether they were going to make it or not and fucking pressure with their family and what's going to happen and blah, blah, blah. And this guy, he had to turn to all these antidepressant, anti-inflammatory, anti-whatever-the-fuck drugs to cope with the pressure of a, of a promoter basically pushing him and paying him more than anybody else in the business with the exception of Hulk Hogan. And that's a lot of pressure. Maybe it was pressure on him because he deep down, he knew he had no idea what he was fucking doing, but he could have asked somebody taken a little more training and, and criticism and, and, and suggestions on board. Anyway, uh, the, the Warrior University, I've told that story. I've, I've, I was there once. I saw it out in Phoenix. Uh, Warrior University was about as successful as Trump University. But then they get to the God damn it. This, this is where they outright lied, and this has already been debunked. The 1996 return, they said his father died and he missed a few shows and got in trouble over it. And I was sitting four feet from Vince McMahon when he got the goddamn fax sent to his house where Warrior had written in saying that he thought that it was bullshit that he was being treated in that fashion after his father had just passed away, he was already no-showing. He was no showing over the trade show fiasco where he tried to leverage him into buying a million of his comic books at a dollar a piece and we'll forget the whole thing. And he was already missing shows. And then when Vince found out and relayed to me and Bruce, as a matter of fact, that Warrior's father had just passed away, Vince followed it up with he hates his father and hasn't spoken to him in 10 years. But at that point, he was using it as, as an excuse why he was not going to come back since he had already started no-showing because he pitched a fit when they put his fucking face paint on the wall at the, in the, of the booth at the trade show. I was there. And that's when Vince was, at one point, going to do him like he did Sid and prorate warrior's contract to where he didn't get his guarantee unless he made all the dates and if he didn't make all of his dates he would lose the amount of his guarantee that was prorated amongst his fucking amount of his contract and it didn't even get there because they weren't going to speak after that um <sighs> but anyway and then they jump ahead to his I, speaking tour. Well, oh, go ahead. Wait a minute. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, you know, they answered the question. A lot of people were wondering, was the documentary going to deal with the most controversial? And I think a lot of people would say the worst part of his public life. And they answered that question. They skipped over WCW. <laughs> yeah, that never happened. Well, see, that was that was the the year that it was a Hogan dream was that season. That's why he was seeing him in the mirror. Um, and then the speaking tour. Apparently, anybody can get booked to speak to college students. Because what would be on this guy's resume that that you would say, well, I'd like to have him come and give an an insightful and inspiring speech to a bunch of college students about what but he's booked to speak at the university of connecticut and goes off about his whole right-wing conservative ideology etc and then gets mad at the gay folks and if his wife tried to explain this but she couldn't she kind of hemmed and hawed he just went off and once again why why would you be I can understand if you don't want to be gay. Why would you be so offended that other people are gay? Except it was he was he it was it a conservative right wing thing or was it a fanatical religion thing? Because those are the two usual suspects. She tried to make it out his wife. She tried to make it out like 
Well, he was listening to a lot of talk radio, so he just started acting it out. <sighs> he listened to a lot of Rush Limbaugh, so he just took on that persona. That was his latest addiction. Uh, and remember, folks, they gave Dana Warrior a job on the creative team. I'm not saying she's a bad person. I forgot about person. that. Oh, my God. I forgot yes, about that. Yes, I'm not saying she's a bad person. I'm not attacking her as a person in any fashion. Anybody that wants to look at this show can come back and say, does that person need a job writing wrestling for a national promotion? Something that she has never, ever done before. That's the that's the bone of contention I have here. They gave her a job after he died. They could have given her a check and just, and, and here you go. But it, But to give her a job, it just insults anybody who actually was qualified for that job um did you notice notice that they talked about the self-destruction of the ultimate warrior but nobody that was self-destructing him was on this show to really recant except for hulk hogan who's as phony as a get well card from an undertaker and i wouldn't believe him if his tongue was notarized um they had video of, of Warrior ranting and raving on video from the basement, and his daughters like him. Hey, let me uh, ask you, what did you think about I mean, there are plenty of people WWE have fallen out with over the years. That self-destruction DVD, what are your thoughts that they went that far to put that out? I got a tickle out of it because I had heard a lot of these stories off air. But nobody had ever been allowed to fucking put them in. And finally, they said, well, you know what? Let's, they, they actually, they didn't phrase it. I talked to a couple of people that were involved. I won't say who, but, um, and I don't even, somebody, one of them may not have even made the cut of the final thing anyway. But nevertheless, they didn't say to these people that I talked to, we want you to bury him. They said, you can tell the truth. Just tell the truth. Whatever you've ever wanted to say about the ultimate warrior, you can tell the truth. You can say it. So it it wasn't a hit piece. It was a true piece. And they, I can't remember, what had he done at that point that they were mad at him again? Had he tried to sue him again? What was it that time? I can't, I, I used to know. And I remember. used to know too, and I can't remember because there were so many twists and turns in everything. It, that was because he had beaten them, I think, in court for something. And then they did that, and then he sued them again over that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they countersued him, and I don't even know. Uh, but anyway, um, and and I mean, see, that's the thing. You can tell the guy was a m mental wreck because in, in, in 2016 or 15, whatever the year was he won the Hall of Fame, he was tearing up in the car at the Hall of Fame weekend about the self-destruction DVD. Tearing up, not cussing mad like, well, I got the last laugh now, but tearing up. Like, of all the things that has ever happened to him in his life, that was the worst. And he apparently believed that, truly believed that he was the biggest star in wrestling and deserved it. And, you know, I blame Vince for giving the guy that mistaken belief, but. But I love, there's Warrior and Hulk, and Hulk's lying right to his face. I love you, man. You know, I've, Hulk is a genius. He just, he, he he can say anything and still recant it later on with, uh, you know, a smile on his face. Uh, but yeah, so this whole show, and I, I did note here, Paul Lee gives great sound bites, but uh, they made Randy Savage out to be a prick. One of the great talents ever. But this asshole comes off like an inspiration to humanity. And the VTR of his Raw promo after the Hall of Fame ceremony, he was still speaking gibberish. That, that When we had lunch with him that day, on the way to WrestleMania 96, he had to stop in Arizona and see his place. And I'd listen to that whole destrucity thing. The promos that he was doing Sound, he sounded exactly like that when he was having a conversation and telling you things. And to the point where I took Bruce out as we were going to the car, out of we ate at one of those 
I can't remember what the fuck. It was a chain steak place, a Western theme. But anyway, we're going to the car, and I said, did you understand a goddamn word he said? He said, no. He's, I said, well, what is he, is he on? So what the fuck's his deal? He said, no, he always sounds like that. That's warrior. There you go. Well, that was the ultimate warrior biography. Of course, we'll have a review of the ultimate warrior dark side of the ring. What's the name of it? Is it the beginning of the ultimate warrior? I forget the name of it. I'm not sure. It's, it's, uh, it's not the self-destruction of that's that was already taken. But you can hear more about that. We'll review that on the experience. But Jim, I think a lot of people see the Ultimate Warrior and they think, boy, that guy, that guy may be a nut. <laughs> yes, folks. And if you haven't noticed over the past couple of weeks, nuts.com is now a new official sponsor of the programs. And over the next several weeks, Brian will be working on his segues. To try to be, you know what I say to people who don't like nuts? I say nuts to you. You no good gum bumping sacks of snake feces. You got to like nuts.com. It's the best kept secret of savvy snackers across the country. They've got the, the, the white chocolate toffee cashews that I love. Bourbon pecans, honey sesame sticks. They've got the pantry with incredible baking items, stuff for smoothies, rolled oats, beans. Kid-friendly snacks, dried strawberries, custom trail mix. You can mix it and make it yourself. Plus all the raw, organic, roasted, salted, and candied nuts and chocolate-dipped nuts that you can imagine. Nutritious, delicious, healthy nuts, dried fruit, flowers, grains, and high-quality foods delivered straight to your door. Quicker than a hiccup. You order it one day, it goes out usually the same day. You get it the next day. It's quicker than going to the grocery store, especially if you live in Montana. So nuts.com, Brian, of course, you've already ordered four times because you got, you know, you got all the rug rats there in the house. They're just, they're all over the nuts. I like it as much as them. It is just great stuff. Everything they send is so good. And then you like it and then you order more and you're like, oh, I should try something else too. And it's just as good as everything else. So now you're just ordering more and more. We've ordered. Uh, you were wrong. It's been three times. The fourth order comes this week because uh, I made the mistake of not asking one of my daughters what she wanted last uh -oh. time. Uh-oh. Although she enjoyed what we got, she didn't get to pick her individual thing. She didn't get to pick her nuts. No. Well, folks, if you're a fan of picking your own nuts, I got news for you. You go to nuts.com and you'll have all the nuts that you can say grace over. And right now. And chocolates. And chocolates. And, and dry fruits. Cho and chocolate nuts and fruits. Fruits and nuts and chocolate. Oh, my. If you go to nuts.com, you can see all this stuff, but you can get a deal because they like us. If you text the word experience, they don't like you, Brian, and your show, the drive through They like, like my show, the experience. But hey. if you text the word experience, I will spell it for you. E-X-P-E-R-I-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Text experience to 64,000, that's 6 four with three zeros behind it, 64,000, text experience, and you'll get free shipping on your first order from nuts.com. You'll go crazy for the nuts, folks. Terms apply. Available at nuts.com slash terms. Nuts!